Hello YouTube, Luigi here. This is part two of my series on climate change and tonight's subject is melt ponds and moulons, specifically in Greenland but this also applies to Antarctica. At first they appeared along the southern perimeter of Greenland, just a few here and there and no one really seemed alarmed, at least not yet. Their propagation then slowly continued up the east and west coasts when climatologists really began to notice. During the melt season, which now begins two months earlier than historical norms and ends two months later, these so-called melt ponds dot the entire surface of Greenland and have begun to make similar headway on Antarctica during its respective melt season. There are now literally hundreds of thousands of them. Their dark blue color makes them highly visible and therefore highly quantifiable from the air. Remember, Greenland is constantly being scanned by both satellite and airship flyovers, which gather up to the minute data on ice mass loss, both in elevation, called deflation, and as glacial retreat. Their color has also set up a dangerous positive feedback loop. As more and more dark blue surface replaces white snow and ice, there's less and less white surfaces reflecting the sun's radiation back into space. Climatologists say that this feedback loop is responsible for the very rapid propagation of these melt ponds. But these melt ponds just don't sit around looking pretty. They coalesce by trickling into small streams. These small streams grow into large streams, which grow into rivers, some of them quite torrential. Some of these surface rivers make it all the way to the sea, spectacularly cascading over the calving faces of very tall glaciers. These waterfalls run 24-7, non-stop, through the duration of the melt season and contribute in no small measure to increased sea level rise. But most of these surface rivers find their way into moulins, giant holes in the ice, some large enough to drop a school bus into. By the time these rivers meet their moulins, they become quite wide, deep and very fast moving. As this warmer surface water falls into these moulons, the pressure they exert on the surrounding glacial walls is sufficient to call, cause hydrofracking. This further fracturing of the glacier gives the water so, several paths down to bedrock, melting more and more glacial ice along the way. Once this warmer meltwater meets the top of the continental bedrock, it flows under the glacier all the way to the sea. This flowing now lubricates the bottom of the glacier, causing a great increase in speed with which these former lumbering giants used to creep. This leads to glacial, increased glacial calving and an increase in sea level rise. In case you don't know, calving is when huge icebergs break off from the leading edge of glaciers and fall into the sea. Because this ice was once on land, its joining the sea directly contributes to sea level rise. But here's the rub. It wasn't that long ago that climate scientists thought that 100% of Greenland's contribution to sea level rise came from calving glaciers. They now estimate that a full 60% is coming from the melt ponds, whether their effluent hits the sea by cascading over the surface of the calving face or whether it's find its, its way down to the sea flowing over the top of the bedrock. And this is the wonderful thing about science in general. As new data are uncovered, science is unashamed to re-examine its assumptions and revise its theories. In fact, this wonderful self-correcting mechanism is one of science's main functions and highest responsibilities. It's unfortunate that so many people still choose to ignore their scholarly, well-studied findings and cling to the unseasoned learning, blatherings of politicians. Okay, that's our subject for tonight, melt ponds and moulons. Stay tuned for part three 
although I don't know what it will be yet. It's going to be something. Um, if you are subscribed, you will get a notice. Thank you for watching. God bless you. I love you all. Good night.